I'm Harriet Vanceball, clinician researcher from McMaster University in Canada, and I'm so delighted to have Professor Scott Solomon from Harvard Medical School, Brigham and Women's Hospital. He's the principal investigator of the Fine Arts HF trial, and we are here at ESC 2024 to discuss his hotline trial and its exciting transformative findings. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Harriet. I'm so glad that we're doing this in person as opposed to the initial Zoom setup. Much better. Yes, um, and your trial has really created a lot of buzz. It provides clear evidence to support the use of non-steroidal MREs in heart failure. I wonder if you could start by giving us a bit of a background and some of the knowledge gaps and uncertainties that informed your hypothesis. Yeah, so uh, we've been trying to find therapies for heart failure with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction, as you know, for many years. And for many years, there was no evidence-based therapy, really, for this disease. Uh, counts for about half of all patients with heart failure, so huge unmet need. Um, and then, of course, uh, we did, 15 years ago, the TopCat trial with an MRA. TopCat trial was flawed. Unfortunately, we realized after unblinding the trial that some of the patients didn't have heart failure. So many of the patients in um, Russia and the Republic of Georgia weren't taking drug. So even though there was a hint in the right patients that there would be a benefit mm -hmm. with an MRA, um, it wasn't definitive data. In the meantime, we kept trying. We did uh, the Paragon trial with Sacubitril, Valsartan, we did the DELIVER trial with dapagliflozin, um, SGLT2 inhibitors, now our class one indications in mm -hmm. patients with heart failure, mildly reduced preserved ejection fraction. But the question is, there's still so much unmet need. Is there more that we can do? So we designed the fine arts trial to test the hypothesis that this new uh, non-steroidal MRA, finerenone, could reduce um, uh, morbidity and mortality in these patients with heart failure with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Tell us a little bit about the drug. So it's a non-steroidal MRA. Why might it be preferred over a steroidal MRA? So non-steroidal MRAs um, and this particular drug is chemically very distinct mm -hmm. from a steroidal MRA. Um, in a number of different ways. It's a very different chemical structure. Um, it is more selective for the mineralic corticoid receptor. Uh, it has a shorter half-life. It has a more balanced distribution between the heart and the kidneys than the steroidal MRAs. And as you know, the steroidal MRA uh, spinolactone, the one we use most often, um, has uh, these pesky side effects mm -hmm. uh, that really limit our use, especially in men mm -hmm. uh, like gynecomastia. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are really the main um, differences. Now how that translates, uh, we have to see. There's never been a really more than a few patient trial head to head mm -hmm. comparing finerenone and a uh, spironolactone, for, for example. Mm -hmm. So we don't have um, all the data on that, but there's a suggestion that um, there should be somewhat less hyperkalemia mm -hmm. for the same level of potency mm -hmm. uh, with a non-steroidal MI than a steroidal MRA. And hyperkalemia has certainly been a cause for concern among clinicians. Many people experience hyperkalemia. They have therapies stopped, sometimes permanently, and so patients are deprived from the benefit of MRA. So a lot of hope potentially provided by this drug. How did you go about establishing the dose that you were going to test in this trial? So uh, interestingly, I mean, uh, you know, we actually used the patient's own GFR to determine what their target dose should be. So in prior trials, uh, with finerenone, which has been tested in patients with diabetes and CKD, uh, they went up to 20 milligrams. Right. Okay, but in this trial, we decided to go up to 40 milligrams in the people with GFRs that were above 60. And so there were two titration schemes. If your GFR was 60 or below, it was actually up to 20. 
uh, milligrams of finerenone, and if it was um, uh, above 60, it was actually up to 40 milligrams of finerenone. Mm -hmm. And was that with the hope that it would provide greater efficacy, presumably? Presumably. I mean, yeah. you, you generally want to choose the dose that is the highest tolerated dose when you're testing these things. So tell us about the study design and some of the nuances in terms of outcome selection. So we, uh, first of all, wanted to enroll patients who had symptomatic heart failure with an LVEF of 40% or over. Um, they had to have evidence of structural heart disease. I wanted to be sure they had a problem with their heart. Mm -hmm. They had to have elevation in natriuretic peptides, and that elevation was dependent on whether um, the degree of elevation was dependent on whether they were in atrial fibrillation or not. So the people in atrial fibrillation had to have a threefold increased um, natriuretic peptide level. Uh, then we um, had to choose our endpoint in those trials, and, and that's always, uh, you know, a, a lot of discussion goes on when we're trying to choose an endpoint. Um, we decided to choose um, a composite of cardiovascular death and worsening heart failure events first and recurrent. So not just the first heart failure event, but total heart failure events. And we included not just hospitalizations for heart failure, but also urgent heart failure visits because we know that you know nowadays we are trying to keep patients out of the hospital. We would sometimes treat people out of the hospital in an urgent setting um, who we might, might have enroll, you know, admitted to the hospital years before. Right, and you used IV diuretics uh, and not oral intensification as one yeah, of those. Yeah, in order to, to fulfill those criteria, you had to um, be treated with IV diuretics. Truly. Okay, uh, what were the baseline characteristics like? Very similar to other trials we've looked at in this area. And what I mean is they were elderly, 72 years uh, mean age, 45% were women. Mm -hmm. um, we did this in 37 countries, so a lot of geographic um, uh, variety there. Mm -hmm. um, the the uh, majority of patients were New York Heart Association class two, about 69%. The mean ejection fraction was 53%. Our uh, median NT pro BNP was just over a thousand. Mm -hmm. Medical history, 40% diabetes, 80 something percent hypertension. And these patients were also on um, the kind of medicines we expect to see them on. Very high use of beta blockers, even though there's no you know, guideline directed mandate for that. Mm -hmm. Very high use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs, probably for hypertension. And we had uh, 13 to 14% of our patients on SGLT2 inhibitors. Which is appropriate for the time at yeah. the period during which you recruited patients. And then you had some roll-ins. We did, we had another made nine or percent or so, so in total oh, just over 20% of people on SGLT2 inhibitors during the course of the trial. Sure. Tell us the primary treatment effect and some of the secondary yeah. um, endpoints as well. So we saw a, um, a primary uh, rate ratio of 0.84, so a 16% relative uh, rate reduction, um, highly significant p-value 0.007. Um, and what we saw was that this was consistent across all pre-specified subgroups. And that includes people uh, whose ejection fractions were on the higher side or on the lower side. And it includes people who were already on SGLT2 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. uh, at baseline, we saw a significant 18% reduction in total heart failure events. And we saw improvement in uh, a measure of health status or quality of life, the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire total symptom score that improved by 1.6 points. Sure, so your primary treatment effect was largely driven by a reduction in heart failure events, which is important, uh, associated with a lot of healthcare resource utilization across countries. And so an important endpoint to meet um, there were some secondary findings that were also important. So you talked about health status. Tell us about some other ones. Well, let me um, first tell you about mortality because sure. we obviously look at both cardiovascular death and all-cause mortality. And these were both uh, numerically lower in the finerenone group, but mm -hmm. we did not um, reach statistical significance. So 
Um, the hazard ratios for both of those was, were 0.93. Mm -hmm. um, not a surprise because we've never seen um, a therapy reduce mortality uh, in heart failure with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction. Very low mortality rates compared to half ref in general. But right. um, we also looked at um, uh, New York Heart Association class, which did not change between the two treatment arms. We had looked at a renal outcome uh, mm -hmm. that consisted of a 50% decline in um, GFR or progression to renal failure. There were many fewer renal events than we expected, mm -hmm. uh, and we did not see a significant difference between those in the treatment groups. Uh, and then safety, that's mm -hmm. very important in a drug like this. So overall, uh, the drug was well tolerated. We actually had numerically fewer serious adverse events in the finerenone group than in the placebo group. Um, this drug, as does all MRAs, makes potassium go up. So we saw um, more hyperkalemia, more elevation in serum potassium, whether you look at this in terms of a, um, a, uh, a laboratory value or investigator reported events. But we saw uh, only 16 hospitalizations due to hyperkalemia in the finerenone group and six in the placebo group, so very small numbers, no deaths due to hyperkalemia. Mm -hmm. And the converse, of course, mm -hmm. is that we had a lot less hypokalemia mm -hmm. in the patients treated with finerenone, and we all know how important uh, a risk factor hypokalemia is. Right, we focus on the risk of hyperkalemia when we use MRAs, but hypokalemia also portends an increased risk of mortality something that's easily depleted when we have patients on loop diuretics. And so that was a reassuring finding. Um, now there were a couple of other meta-analyses that put some of your findings into the big picture and give us a bird's eye view of where this drug fits. So this trial comes on the background of um, Figaro DKD and Fidelio DKD, yep. and you pulled the patients from this trial with those patients who had cardio kidney metabolic disease. And a couple of important findings, I thought, in that meta-analysis. Um, tell us about that, if you will. Yeah, um, so uh, obviously this is an overlapping patient population. Mm -hmm. We see patients with um, heart failure and diabetes and kidney disease. It's basically one large Venn diagram, of mm -hmm. course. So we pulled these data because now we have 18,000 patients treated with um, uh, finerenone. And the main reason to pull the data was to see if we could see a benefit with respect to cardiovascular mortality. Um, well, we just fell short of significance for that um, in the pre-specified analysis. If we include uh, the undetermined deaths in, in another way than we did in the primary analysis, we then uh, drop below p-value 0.05, but interestingly, and that's for cardiovascular death, all-cause mortality was significantly mm -hmm. reduced um, in, in the patients receiving finerenone. So I think it suggests that there's so much overlap here that we have to start, get out of our silos and start thinking about um, uh, this, uh, what's now being called CKM, cardio kidney metabolic, as really one um, big group of patients. Mm -hmm. And because the baseline event rates for the kidney events was higher in this pooled cohort, um, you were able to have the statistical power and the secondary analyses to show a reduction in kidney endpoints. Yes. Um, you mentioned all-cause mortality. I thought another important measure, perhaps a surrogate one, but an important one was AFib. Yeah. Right? There was a reduction in AFib, I believe. Yeah, there was. Um, and. It nicely uh, highlights the broad indications for MRAs, and in this case, non-steroidal MRAs, not only in HEF-PEF, but in kidney disease, diabetic kidney disease, and another comorbidity that's highly prevalent that we have to manage with polypharmacies, hypertension. Yeah. And um, primary aldosteronism is uh, a, a, a common underlying cause that we often underdiagnose. So potentially a way to target hypertension. Tell us about the blood pressure effects. 
Yeah. In fine arts. So in fine arts, we lowered blood pressure by approximately three millimeters. Um, and so one question is, does that account for the treatment benefit? It, it doesn't. We put the blood pressure lowering into our model and we don't see any attenuation of the treatment effect. So it suggests that um, it's, it is lowering blood pressure. Mm -hmm. It's an effective blood pressure lowering medication, mm -hmm. but that doesn't account for the benefit. I'm going to end by asking you a question that uh, is based on John McMurray and Pradeep Jhun's uh, meta-analysis, yeah. where finerenone fits with the steroidal MRA. So this was uh, an IPD, individual patient data meta-analysis of all of the MRA trials in this space. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so I think now um, we clearly have uh, steroidal MRAs proven to be beneficial in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction from the RALS and the EMPHASIS trial. Mm -hmm. um, this is the only positive trial in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. When we put the data together with the TOPCAT trial, um, we do see evidence that MRAs are beneficial across the full spectrum. Um, I think that uh, we can definitively say now that um, steroidal MRAs have shown benefit in HEFREF, non-steroidal MRAs in HEFPEF. Um, you know, a lot of this, uh, these trials are done at different points in time. So how you put this all together is, uh, is, a, is a bit nuanced, but I think it suggests that we need to be using more MRAs in general. Mm -hmm. um, we should go where the evidence is. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, being able to use this drug as another potential um, pillar, if you will, mm -hmm. in patients with heart failure with mildly reduced and preserved ejection fraction. We had, didn't have anything just a few years ago, so it's mm -hmm. great that now we do. Nice synergies with SGLT2 inhibitors. I do think our guidelines will change to incorporate evidence from your trial. Thank you so much for being here and for spending for your time me. disseminating knowledge from the fine arts trial, Scott. Thanks so much, Harriet.